generous introduction. I'm really excited to be here today um, and I'm going to try my best to keep this to the 30 minutes that I have. Um, I want to thank Gustav Mauch for his leadership, for dreaming up this remarkable space, turning it into a reality, and keeping it humming as such a vibrant hub for the research in the environmental humanities. I've been tracking its activities with keen curiosity since its very founding um, and I'm so thrilled and honored to be a Rachel Carson Center Fellow. Uh, I want to express my sincere gratitude to my fellow fellows at the Lent House, most of whom are here today, for all of the wonderful communal experiences that we've had and all the edifying exchanges. I look forward to carrying them forward. And I'm going to transition before I start crying because a lot of us are in the process of, of departing and moving right now. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to share my book, Sea Change, An Atlas of Islands and a Rising Ocean, with you in this guest lecture today. Sea Change, as Hannah mentioned, is forthcoming. It will be published by the University of California Press in 2023, and it is available for pre-order now. So tell your uh, institutions, your home librarians, um, your colleagues. I want to start with a brief preamble of two impetuses for this project. Um, in 2009, I covered the UN climate negotiations in Copenhagen, and I've been covering them, as Hannah mentioned in the introduction, ever since. What I observed at these negotiations differed starkly from what I saw represented in most mainstream media. And unfortunately, what I'm going to sketch out here, I think, holds true again today as we're in a new era of the Cold War, in my estimation. There's about 198 members. The numbers sometimes fluctuate um, that participate in these annual conferences. That's 197 nations and the EU. Uh, when you go to, to the, um, the UN climate negotiations, what happens as a delegate or as a journalist covering them, what happens or what you see is that nations weigh in on negotiations one by one, but also as part of the UN clusters that they're a part of. So there's the Africa group the alliance of small island states, the least developed countries, and the small island developing states, to name only a few. The conference takes place in November, so that means it falls on the heels of the active cyclone, hurricane, and typhoon season. So when the nations speak individually, or as part of these aforementioned clusters, over the course of the negotiations, which go on for an entire two weeks, what you come away with is a visceral sense of what is going on, the climate impacts in different nations around the world. So for example, just before the 2009 UN climate negotiations, Mohamed Nasheed, who was then Prime Minister of the Maldives in the Indian Ocean, held an underwater cabinet meeting to bring attention to how at risk his low-lying island nation is to sea level rise. This is, the Maldives is one of the four most at-risk island nations with regard to sea level rise. Uh, the other ones are Tuvalu, uh, Marshall Islands, and Kiribati. Current impacts it, with regard to the climate crisis that are going on currently uh, include this fall's floods in Pakistan, which flooded a third of the country and unleashed over 15 billion US dollars of damage and killed over 1,700, as well as the drought in the Horn of Africa, which has displaced over 1.1 million people, killed over 7 million livestock, and destroyed crops. And I mention these two examples because I want you to think about whether or not you've seen them at the forefront of your media feeds over the course of the UN climate coverage or not. This contrasts starkly with the impression one gathers from the headlines of the UN Climate Conference, which is typically focused on the US-China standoff, which to be sure is not unimportant, as the world's, they are the world's largest emitters historically and present day, respectively. My concern, however, is that this focus occludes from view the rest of the globe, which has been experiencing the climate crisis effects already and disproportionately. An interest in bringing some of these stories to greater attention, tapping my work in environmental journalism on the one hand and environmental humanities on the other hand led to my current book project. And then meanwhile, here's the other influence, and I'm probably not gonna mention this when I go forward and give guest lectures, but I thought given that we're in Germany, this might be important context. Meanwhile, right on the heels of this 2009 conference, in 2010, German author Judith Shalansky published her best-selling Atlas of Remote Islands, 50 Islands I Have Never Set Foot On and Never Will. I'm happy to talk about it more in the Q&A. 
Shalansky studied art history and communication design, and she was also trained as a book designer in what was then East Germany. She subsequently taught typography at the Fachhochschule Potsdam and now works as an author and a designer. Her first book published, Fraktur Mon Amour, Gothic Type, My Love, a love letter to the history and variations of Gothic letter type, won numerous awards for its design. Shalansky not only wrote the text for, but also designed and typeset Atlas of Remote Islands. It's an exquisitely designed and award-winning book. I wish I had my copy with me here. Pass it around. Um, stylistically, Shalansky's Atlas adheres to some of the most classic markers of the genre. It uses the traditional shades of blue and yellow associated with atlases, and the islands are shown on a scale of 1 to 125,000, which is a classic measurement for atlases. Contrary to the paradisical images that one might associate with islands, especially at this time of the year, the essays in an atlas of remote islands contain dark undertones, sharing narratives of places that are not idols, as the monsters that were once on colonial maps lingered in the Western literary imagination. Think here of Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe from 1719 and its cannibals, Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea from 1870 and its sea monsters, or Golding's Lord of the Flies from 1954 and its community breakdown. Note to the demographics represented. Note the demographics occluded by geography, gender, race, class, etc. As I read and reread Shalansky's Atlas, what I missed most was the voices of islanders. I considered what was invisibilized, which narrowed vantage points, which histories, which stories, and whose stories. So I came up with the idea for Sea Change, an atlas of islands in a rising ocean. It shares the impacts of sea level rise on 49 islands around the world, weaving together maps, environmental sto studies, and stories about its histories, cultures, and centering their voices. Sea change presents both the effects of climate change as island nations and islanders fight to address them, but my book also takes a different tack than previous studies. Drawing on over a decade of work as an environmental journalist and, as mentioned, my scholarship in the environmental humanities, specifically literary studies, which combined led to considerations and exchanges about which narrative strategies best reach audiences, I came up with the idea for this book. So it's intended to be at once playful, yet intellectually rigorous um, and serious. Sea Change aims to make a visually engaging and yet rigorous intervention in climate change debates, focusing on oft overlooked regions of the world, so-called remote islands. So basically, my experience of covering the annual UN, uh, UN climate negotiations for two weeks made me aware of, um, on the one hand, how difficult it is to translate science to lay readers, because that's what environmental journalists do. Um, and that's a challenge in and of itself, but also how tough it is, and I think we engage this a lot if we're working in the environmental humanities, how tough it is to sustain interest and lead readers to care about the issue and to want to take action. That may not be what all of us are trying to do, but that was one of the questions I had for myself. So to be candid and frank, a coffee table book seemed one way to smuggle a message to a greater audience. Sea Change features a map of an island or an archipelago on a recto page and information about the island on a verso page. This information includes the ocean or sea on which it is located, the island's longitude or latitude for some islands, but not for others, to acknowledge the traditional Arabic and oceanic navigation systems based on observations of the stars, the ocean swells, the flight patterns of birds, and other natural signs the island's original or other names, the languages spoken there, both often bespeaking colonial legacies, its size or area, whether or not it's inhabited, and if so, the name of its indigenous people's nation, its population, its distance from other neighboring islands, and a brief timeline highlighting its history, indigenous and so-called pre-contact, colonial and climate change related 1500 roughly to the present. The page also features a paragraph-long essay of creative nonfiction that includes histories and stories illuminating key aspects of the island, its history, its flora, its fauna, its inhabitants, their languages and culture. And lastly, it presents the impacts of sea level rise on the island uh, and the solutions being put forward often by the island's inhabitants, be they political solutions negotiated at home or abroad, 
such as buying land elsewhere and resettling an entire population, or on the ground practical solutions of so-called soft engineering, such as preserving coral or oyster reefs, or planting mangroves, or of so-called hard engineering, such as building seawalls. These maps offer a bird's eye view or a vertical point of view of the island, which I realize is a colonial genre, and I'll get to that in a minute, with shading around the highlighting the sea level, uh, with shading around the islands highlighting the sea level rise in 2020 when I started this book project and projected for 2050 and 2100. Each island, as I mentioned, is accompanied by an essay which I authored, a map created by cartographer Molly Roy with whom I collaborated, and poems or texts by islanders. Their voices are also included in my essays as I conducted endless interviews for each island. The atlas also includes scientific illustrations by scientific illustrator, Zina Duretsky. So for this particular audience, I've spent the last two weeks and my Landhouse fellows have heard me talk about this ad nauseum, some of them, uh, agonizing over which format to give um, in terms of the content of what I'm gonna talk about that follows. For this audience, I thought it appropriate to offer both a reading of sections of the book and a behind the scenes peek at what theory studies or approaches inform my book. And that latter section is gonna be memorialized in what's being taped here today, but will probably fall by the wayside as I move forward to give talks about the book. Um, and that's specifically because we're in an academic context and also because so many of you are students or at, at some level in the field of uh, education. So in my talk today, I want to discuss three fields that my book draws on and brings together, namely geography and cartography, that's the first, environmental studies and environmental humanities, that would be the second one, and then thirdly, literary studies and creative nonfiction, predominantly Pacific Islander indigenous studies and black Caribbean, often black feminist materialist Caribbean studies. So let me start with geography and cartography. Artist and... Geographer Trevor Peglin coined the term experimental geography in 2002 and wrote about it in a 2008 article titled Experimental Geography from Cultural Production to the Production of Space, published in the edited volume Experimental Geography. There's a theme here. The concept refers to and builds on the work of Nato Thompson, who's editor of the aforementioned volume and who wrote in his article titled In Two Directions, quote, of geography as art and of art as geography. Drawing on both fields art and geography, Peglin at once tracks what stories geography tells us, thereby bringing what might have otherwise been invisible or conjecture to the historical record. Peglin has a history of tracking what might have been, what has been invisibilized or rendered invisible. In a 2010 book, he tracked what he called the blank spots on the map, the dark geography of the Pentagon's secret world, that is, places that officially do not exist and that include secret US military bases. The rendered in images in his 2010 monograph of photography, Invisible co uh, cover, ob cover Operations and Classified Landscapes. But Peglin also recognizes that while mapping or geography tells one version of how the present came to be, it can share the stories of what possible plans were foreclosed. So to that end, it can suggest alternate futures, futures that were foreclosed, or possible futures that can be activated. That is the very act of mapping could activate the speculative and movement for a different future. So in terms of the speculative, I am of course here also thinking of the rich genre of speculative fiction from Octavia Butler to Nala Hopkinson, from Nettie Okorafor to N.K. Jemison and of what Fred Moten refers to as the speculative practice. As cartographers and radical geographers grappled with how to challenge or open up the field of mapping and of geography from its colonial uh, origins, many began to develop creative alternatives. Oops, I already jumped ahead, didn't I? Okay. Uh, radical cartographers, for example, use mapping to support social change vis-a-vis -vis a range of issues, including but not limited to land use, energy justice, incarceration, and migration. Liz Mogul and Alexis Bogat's Atlas of Radical Cartography, which was both a 2009 traveling exhibit and a book of 10 maps and 10 essays, engages social issues ranging from, quote, globalization to garbage, surveillance to extraordinary rendition, statelessness to visibility, deportation to migration, end quote. 
In this way, radical cartography cuts across the disciplinary boundaries, otherwise separating, separating the fields of art, cartography, geography, creative nonfiction, and environmental and energy studies, among other fields. Rebecca Solnit's Atlas Trilogy does this type of work too, cutting across disciplines and at once recovering different histories, for instance, linguistic or musical, and engaging the speculative, suggesting different futures. For example, one map published in Nonstop Metropolis and also as a cover of The New Yorker relabels all the New York City subway stops with New York City women's names. This renaming calls attention to how men's names dominate or how women's names are less prominent in public monuments, thereby also erasing women's contributions to history. But it also suggests an opportunity to do better. So again, this speculative. My project stands in the lineage of these methodologies of experimental geography on the one hand and critical geography on the other hand in that it connects and bridges disciplines and approaches but also engages the speculative. Atlases, as I've mentioned, are of course a colonial genre. So Atlas of Islands and a Rising Ocean also works to decolonize atlases. It engages different conceptualizations of spatiality and temporality. So it includes, for example, Inuit wood carved maps. Here's the text from my book from Sea Change accompanying this map. To the Inuit, the process of making the map, the story that was relayed, was more often impo more important than the map itself. What was centered was the knowledge of the, reason, of, of the region, the recall and the relaying of it. Working in Nunavut, Canada, geographer Robert A. Runstrom writes, quote, one Inuk elder told me that he had drawn detailed maps of Hikulijak, Yathkayad Lake from memory, but he smiled and said that long ago he had thrown the maps away. It was the act of making them that was important. The recapitulation of environmental features, not the material objects themselves, end quote. The focus was on the knowledge that went into mapping rather than on the map. This knowledge connected the lessons from the past to the present, and it was based on a deep knowledge of and connection to the space. Some argue that it's the difference between cartography and map making. In Greenland, the Eastern Inuit carved three such wooden carvings, today known as the Amosalic maps. Now Greenland's coastline is changing quickly and radically due to sea level rise. An island-focused perspective that is one centered on an island and radiating out from it differs dramatically historically, politically, culturally, linguistically, and environmentally. Oceanic voyagers navigated Wananui, the great, let me just make sure I'm on the right, okay. <laughs> without the use of magnetic compasses to determine direction, without the use of sextants to measure the distance between a celestial body and the horizon, and without longitude, which presupposes the Greenwich Meridian. Instead, they steered by the stars and kept course by reading the swells and the shifts in the wind patterns. The Marshallese created stick charts to map ocean swells. They used the presence of birds such as terns and noddies, boobies and frigate birds, and clouds, their color, brightness, and shape to determine their proximity to archipelagos and islands. Micronesian voyagers designed a side reel compass to divide the horizon into points and map where the stars rise and set. It's not only about decentering the continental gaze, in, in this way. It's also about recentering islands and about decentering the human and recentering the relationships among the human to the celestial, to the waves, the non human, the more than human, the animals on land, in the sky, in the waters, and the land, air, and waters themselves. Let me share a little bit more about stick charts from the Marshall Islands. Although the Marshall Islands uh, land area is only 70 square miles, or 181 square kilometers. Its exclusive economic zone, or EEZ, measures over 1 million square miles, 2.5 million kilometers of ocean. This wide oceanic expanse in which the Marshall Islands rest led the Marshallese to become among the oceans, Oceania's best navigators. Marshallese constructed stick charts to navigate the Pacific Ocean. They're made of palm ribs and sticks, bound by sennit or coconut fiber. The stick charts document ocean swells. Swells are generated by strong winds but travel far beyond the wind systems that create them, and they remain long after the wind has died away. 
Swells from distant origins tend to have a longer and slower undulation than swells and wind waves from nearby sources, which are shorter and steeper. Importantly, and this is where the stick chart comes in, when swells reach islands, they bounce back off of those islands and counter swells, which radiate back to an approached Qing boat, and if one is sensitized to this, are perceptible. So on stick charts such as this one, the straight sticks represent regular currents and waves, the seashells represent islands and atolls, and the curved sticks represent ocean swells. They document understanding of swells and how islands bend them. This detail helps to navigate the open oceans. Even if an island is not visible on the horizon, its distant effects can be felt in the water. While islands neighboring the Marshall Islands, such as Kiribati and the Solomon Islands, as well as more distant Tonga, all had knowledge of swells, stick charts are unique to the Marshall Islands, where the study of swells is the most developed. Stick charts do not represent exact distances between islands, nor are they consulted during the journey, unlike maps in the Western navigation. They're mnemonic devices that help remember the information that they contain. It's shared orally by the maker's explanation and paired with the experiential. So in these ways, stick charts are interwoven with an oral tradition that's handed down and with embodied knowledge learned by being in and on the water. The knowledge is mapped onto a felt knowledge of the swells, which is experienced by being in the water. As Marshallese Raymond de Broom, speaking about the training of navigators, put it, quote, these elder skippers, first of all, would take the younger man out into the ocean. They would lay the young man in the water on his back and tell him to float and relax so he would get to know the feel of the waves as they came along, end quote. Reading these swells to navigate the ocean was akin to reading bridges in the snow. That is sastrugi, a method used by the Chukchi in Russia for finding their way across the tundra, or akin to reading, in ridges, reading sand ridges in the desert, each produced by winds. Aside from rethinking cartography in relationships to space, sea change also rethinks temporality in relationships to time. So each entry has a timeline but I aim not to include indigenous people within settler colonial frameworks, and here I'm engaging the work of Mark Rifkin in his book Beyond Settler Time. This approach also stands in conversation with indigenous speculative fiction from Grace Dillon to Eden Robinson, from Stephen Graham Jones to Joshua Whitehead. Let me turn from the geographical framing now to the environmental components of this project. And I'm short on this section because we're at an institute that most people are, where most people are focused on the environment, so I'm assuming hopefully people have some knowledge of this, but in case not, sea levels rise mainly as a result of two factors, each created by, the, by global warming. So first, increased ocean temperatures lead to thermal expansion. When water heats up, it expands, so warmer oceans take up more space. Second, melting land ice leads to sea level rise. Land ice includes glaciers and ice caps, as well as the ice sheets in Antarctica and Greenland, and Greenland contributes about 20% of sea level rise. But addressing sea level rise is not only an environmental science issue, it's also an environmental justice issue. And I don't have time to get into all the thoughts that I have around how to connect those two, but I'm happy to talk about how I did that in my teaching at Princeton when I was there before coming here, if that's something people want to hear about in the Q&A. In Let Them Drown, the 2016 London Edward W. Said lecture reprinted in the London Review of Books, Naomi Klein called attention to the nexus of climate change, colonialism, and economic inequities. But, I should say to my surprise in a way, she shifted the spotlight onto oft-overlooked low-lying island states. Their current situation is dire. On May 6, 2016, scientists announced that five Solomon Islands have disappeared due to rising sea levels. In 2017, three more islands were found to have disappeared in the Pacific region. And on October 24, 2018, East Island at the western edge of the Hawaiian archipelago was permanently wiped off the map by Hurricane Molokka. While it's a small island not inhabited by humans, it's a critical habitat for the endangered Hawaii monk seal, threatened green sea turtles, as well as seabirds. On April 25, 2018, a study commissioned by the U.S. Department of Defense was published in the journal Science Advances, and it found, quote, more than a thousand low-lying islands risk becoming uninhabitable by the middle of the century or possibly sooner because of rising sea levels upending the populations of some island nations, end quote. 
And of course, the US military consumes more fossil fuels than many entire nations, and many nations spend 30 times more on their militaries than they do on addressing the climate crisis. I'm happy to talk about the US's use of islands for military bases in the Q&A. Addressing climate change impacts is very much an environmental justice issue, as I mentioned, since they tend to affect the global south disproportionately. <coughs> Pacific islands are some of the regions most impacted by sea level rise, but according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, they've been responsible for producing merely 0.03% of global CO2 emissions. Figures for islands in the Caribbean are similar. When reports announced the CO2 emissions have, that CO2 emissions have reached new record peaks, it's key to bear in mind both the inequity in terms of CO2 production and its impacts. In this regard, addressing the climate crisis and sea level rise offers an opportunity to address, address centuries-old inequities of colonialism and of imperialism. Islands in the Pacific, the Caribbean Sea, the Indian Ocean, and the Atlantic are already experiencing these devastating impacts of the climate crisis, and they're only projected to increase. Until recently, little attention was paid to the struggles of island nations related to climate change. And the reasons for the oversight of the impact of climate change on island nations are numerous, and I'll, I'll list five of them. First, Pacific islands are located remote from continental land masses. This is that continental gaze that I was talking about. As New Zealand historian Paul de Arce has argued, colonizations and its territorial carving up of the Pacific and replacement of, exist of existing structures with new institutions often defined islands as isolated spaces. But this reading erases from view as Fiji-based Tongan anthropologist Epele Haofa has pointed out the relations among Pacific islands that inform both the real and the imaginary. As Haofa famously wrote in R.C. of Islands, quote, there is a gulf of difference between viewing the Pacific as islands in a far sea and as a sea of islands, end quote. Glissant, Edward Glissant wrote similarly about the concept of relationality for the Caribbean. Glissant's translator, Betsy Wing, referred to his writings as textual geography, that is, as writings, essayistic or poetic, that perform the very geography of the islands. The concepts of relationality put forward in Poetics of Relation complements the other concept that Glissant is uh, well known for, that he put forward, which is antilianité. Glissant elaborates the concept comparing islands in the Caribbean and the Pacific, saying, quote, the Caribbean is a sea that explodes the scattered lands into an arc, a sea that diffracts without necessarily inferring any advantage whatsoever to their situation. The reality of archipelagos in the Caribbean or the Pacific provides a natural illustration of the thought of relation, end quote. So relation means not only that the islands refer to one another rather than a colonial center, that would have been the negritude, the, his criticism of the concept of, of negritude and that it was, yes, focused on Africa, but still focused on the colonial center. But the relation also means that these islands refer to one another respecting differences and particularities, but also that they're interdependent and in a horizontal form of relation. So it's focused more on that Caribbean Sea or that region. These relations among islands are evidenced as scholar Teresa Shuri underscores in quote, myths and legends, shared linguistic roots and material histories such as exploration, migration, kinship, and tracing. Theorists such as Epele Haofa and Al Wendt, Shuri writes, flip or undo, quote, the European tendency to isolate the land from the sea using the term Oceania to connect the sea, the islands, and all of their life, end quote. So in other words, while colonizers or contemporary continent dwellers read the islands as remote and as isolated, Pacific Islanders dispersed among an ocean reading it as the center deem themselves to be very much connected. Given colonialism's hegemony and discourse that has shaped historical, cultural, and geographic narratives, this framing has had lasting impacts. Second, relative to the world population, a low proportion lives in the vast region of the Pacific Ocean. As Henry Kissinger famously quipped about the forced relocation of residents of Bikini Atoll in the Republic of Marshall Islands to make room for the US military's nuclear testing on their home island, quote, there's only 90,000 people out there who gives a damn, end quote. Charles de Gaulle had similar things to say about islands in the Caribbean, referring to them as mere specks of dust when he flew over them. 
So population density becomes a way of creating hierarchies between regions, be they continents and islands, or we might be familiar with this, uh, in, on continents between urban and real, uh, rural regions. Thirdly, the colonialism and fourthly, current day imperialism informs these aforementioned readings of islands as remote and isolated rather than as connected and as part of an oceanic network and as sparsely populated and thus less important. But it also manifests through disproportionate use of islands for nuclear military tests by France, the US, and the UK, and for military bases. And then fifthly and lastly, climate change induced sea level rise itself needs to be considered more carefully for its root causes. Most of these texts will probably be familiar to most of you. Scholars from Simon Lewis and Mark Maslin to Heather Davis and Zoe Todd to Catherine Yusuf have all put into question the Anthropocene tomato, tomato, Anthropocene, Anthropocene term since the fossil fuel economy was not created, nor is it perpetuated by humankind in general. Energy usage both historically and currently varies radically by geography, class, race, income, among other factors. In other words, the historical responsibility for having produced and thus for addressing climate change rests with the so-called developed world or global north. And it's for this reason that the call for climate reparations or a loss and damage fund was particularly vocal at this year's UN climate negotiations. In these ways, climate change and sea level rise cannot be read outside a history of colonialism and imperialism. And precisely here, the humanities difference, uh, humanities disciplines, in my estimation, can make crucial interventions and contributions, reframing how we got to where we are today and how to rethink political, economic, and environmental structures, especially when we're in the field of, of teaching, to create a livable future. Happy to talk about that more in the Q&A. Uh, let me turn now to sea level rise and its impacts very briefly before I conclude, because I am keeping an eye on the clock. Tools for checking predicted sea level rise for different locations in the US are available online. So you can, uh, that's, let's go the other direction. Uh, through Climate Central Surging Sea Site and the US National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administrations uh, sea level rise viewer. While they work really well for the continental US, they work less well for under-resourced and thus under-documented low-lying islands, we found as we were using these sources, especially uh, Climate Central for, for uh, base maps for the book. So we're back to the cycle of why these islands are under-resourced and under-documented and how the issues that led to these inequities are reproduced in their lack of documentation. And thus, an inability, because no documentation, to take steps to address and protect against sea level rise impacts. The maps in sea change highlight what infrastructure will be underwater. This is typically airports, as you can see on this map of Kiribati in the Pacific. Um, I'm going to skip ahead here a little bit in the interest of time. Um, it also includes highways. The infrastructure also includes, as you can see um, on this map from the Seychelles in the Indian Ocean off the coast of Africa, it also includes power plants, especially nuclear power plants, which need to be near water for cooling, as well as electric power plants that are not nuclear. Uh, water treatment facilities, which you see on the slide behind me, so uh, the facilities that treat both sewer and fresh water. Rising sea levels have numerous effects on low-lying islands. As ever, there's commonalities and patterns, but there's always also differences in these impacts across geographies and geologies. Even what seems like a very small increase measured in um, few feet or beaters can devastate colonial habit coastal habitats, making them uninhabitable. So here you see the Marshall Islands, and it sits on average uh, less than six and a half feet or two meters above sea level rise and ranges from about 160 feet or a dozen meters across to one mile or 1.6 kilometers wide. Additionally, the combination of higher sea levels and increased storm seasons in unpredictability and intensity leads to storm surges. So when you have surging seawater, it floods housing, and that means even if a house, a home isn't underwater, it's been inundated and it's become uninhabitable. And that often leads residents to relocate. Rising sea levels challenge not only human, but also animal habitats. They create a loss for fish and birds, as well as plants. And rising sea levels flood agricultural lands, and they upset the balance of soil salinity or salt content in soil, so otherwise known as salinization. Salinization in the soil is a concern because excess salt hinders crops' abilities to take up water. 
And then you have the fact that global warming leads to droughts and depleted wells. So, um, depleted wells. So, low lying island nations typically face water scarcity, and they're therefore challenged by the double whammy of too much salt water and not enough fresh water. The salinization of aquifers and resulting limited drinking water, as, as well as of agricultural soils, makes life on islands increasingly unsustainable. And I'm going to skip ahead from this one, which you can all admire. It's Steel Island, Chesapeake Bay in 2020, 2050, and 2100. That's the long story short. Um, so let me zoom out now from Deal Island and Islands. Sea level rise not only affects island nations. With regard to sea level rise, island nations, especially in the Pacific and the Caribbean, but also in the Indian Ocean, are the canaries in the coal mine. That is, what happens to them is also a harbinger of the future that awaits the residents of coastal cities and shorelines. Internationally, the cities projected to be affected most include, but are not limited to Guangzhou and Shanghai, in China, Hong Kong, Mumbai, India, Amsterdam, the Netherlands, Lagos, Nigeria, Manila in the Philippines, Dakar in Senegal, and Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. Uh, these are two articles that The Guardian published in 2017, just highlighting which cities are going to be most impacted. The difference between continental cities and island residents, <coughs> residents from cities can retreat inland. For many islands, sea level rise may spell the end of their nation's very existence. And that means a geographic place and the history, languages, cultures, etc., etc., attached to it. Thanks for your time. I can't wait for the discussion. <laughs>